Welcome, everyone, uh, to the Spring Open House. Um, I hope you enjoyed the day and were able to get a sense of the school. Certainly, it's been great to have you all and to hear your questions. And as a result, uh, it is helpful for us to get a sense of the school through your eyes and, and, and your set of questions. Tonight, I couldn't be more thrilled to welcome our guest speaker. Few people are expanding architecture's potential in the world in as exciting ways as Andres Haki. Longtime faculty here at GSAP, Andres is well known amongst our students, many of whom become his most avid fans after taking his studio or having him as a critic. And he is certainly a wonderful colleague, always pushing all of us to reconsider what we are doing, what we mean, and inviting us through his own work and the conversations he brings to open up new ways of seeing and of engaging through architecture and design. And so in the spirit of opening up, and on the occasion of this being an open house for prospective students and future architects, I thought I would start by sharing a story of when I was a student as a way to cast what Andres' work means for me. In the first year of my BArc in architecture at McGill University in Montreal, I found myself in an amazing class with classmates who have remained long time, long, lifelong friends. We would always critique each other's work in studio, share recent books and magazines we had taken out of the library, yes, the library, <laughs> and talk about what was happening in the bigger cities, New York in particular. McGill was great, but one of the things a group of us weren't on board with was the divorce between the design studio and the history theory classes. Caught between a very accomplished professional building program and a recently launched attempt at a phenomenological position for the school, led by a renowned scholar named Alberto Perez Gomez, who, it seemed to us, was very concerned with the Western canon and Catholic churches in particular, we didn't feel we quite fit, and certainly didn't fit, find it reflected some of the questions we knew we had, but couldn't articulate well enough yet. And so a group of us, which later we realized were collectively brown-haired, red-haired, with dreadlocks, with glasses, bald, Arab, Jewish, gay, black, androgynous, etc. you get the picture of the group, got together and started a reading and discussion group first called Feminism and Architecture, and later called On Gender and Space. It was one of the most important non-class class I ever took, which taints my thinking until today. But while the readings on power, gender, and space were mind-blowing, from Foucault to Judith Butler and from Derrida to Beatrice Colomina, amongst other, the parallel architecture and design work that was emerging at the time was, for me, just not as powerful as the discourses they were trying to engage. And even with the few exceptional work that I found so compelling at the time, the inevitability of the body, Chumi's falling figure or Diller and Scofidio's woman machine, seemed unnerving. One would spend so much time articulating why the biological body didn't matter, and that, that by the time that argument was made, it left everyone hanging with what the real impact on architecture as architecture could be. And so, my first encounter with Andres Hake's work, almost 20 years later, represented one of those aha moments. It was with his exquisitely beautiful, yummy and plastic, delicate yet powerful, and just completely surprising installation at the Architecture Biennale in 2010, entitled Frey from Home. Here, everything that I would have hoped an architecture that engaged the issues we were discussing at the school was finally made tangible in all its spatial, structural, material, environmental, typological, programmatic, and political presence. But in addition, the limits of body politics had now finally disappeared, replaced by the deconstructed domestic spaces they inhabit and their intimacy as a literal, physical, gorgeous deconstruction, which staged, hanging in midair, a cloud of apples and bananas, sharks and weird blue foam things, all connected to register without ever showing the body, the most intimate bodily actions now connected to the large territories of labor and extraction that are reshaping the entire face of the earth for our little individual comforts. 
Here was, in one space, the experience of our interconnectedness and the conflicts that design negotiates every day. And so Andres's work, across its scales and mediums, does what I believe is maybe the most important thing we can do today as architects, to render the invisible visible, not only through architecture and design, but more importantly for us, by situating architecture and design as the voice in which and through which our world likes to conceal things. Whether it is by showing all that was left out of the perfectly centered sequence of frames of the seminal Eames Power of Ten, or by letting Mises Barcelona Pavilion's hidden basement come upstairs to suntan by the pool, or whether it is by registering water systems in the city to create Cosme, his beautiful, soft, porous, and overscaled installation, which turns solid at night when its floating tiny planktons light up the party in the courtyard of MoMA PS1, Andres's work urges us to look behind, to look above and under, to zoom in and zoom out, to look differently, but always to look through and with design and architecture. For if our architecture is an active agent in the concealing of the systems we operate within, sometimes very literally, then we architects, the experts at value engineering that we are, could possibly re-engineer new values project alternate relations, and design other environments for the future. There's so much more I could say about Andres' work, and you have come here to hear him and not me, so I will leave you with only two more things that touch me about Andres' work. I love the pleasure and play and all the excess of life he reminds us we are capable of, and want to thank him for the energy and all the, he has already contributed to the school and will hopefully continue to exponentially contribute but also, I love the ways in which Andres' work creates new audiences and communicates so fundamentally and viscerally to people across backgrounds and contexts, and I suspect even to animals. <laughs> Just as an example, and in the spirit of giving stage to the sometimes invisible, I want to thank Laila Catelier, who co-directs events as well as often assembles amazing notes for me to prepare my introductions. Sometimes, I can see by her notes that she is just utterly bored by the speaker I am about to introduce. But for tonight, she wrote, quote, Andres put so many great things into the world. This was so much easier for me. So thanks, Lila, for all your hard work and thoughtfulness. <laughs> and uh, please join me in welcoming Andres Haki. Well, thank you very much for this emotional and uh, exciting and fun uh, presentation that I, I love. I'm very honored to be, to be here today in such a special day. The open house is uh, one of the most exciting moments uh, in the school and uh, in this school that is uh, in itself so important and so much in the, in the center of many discussions and possibilities. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here. Um, very, very, very honored and uh, excited to talk to you. Okay, I'll go to the point and I will propose everyone to take notes because I'm going to be very fast. So if there's something that you're <laughs> missing, uh, uh, take notes and I'll be happy to, to respond somehow uh, afterwards. Okay, in the last years I've been uh, trying with, with my office, the Office for Political Innovation, we've been trying to look at architecture as uh, an opportunity to rethink politics. Uh, architecture is in the middle of so many things. It's mediating uh, almost in every situation that we're part of. And we've been trying to see what is the angles and the kind of the sections that could enable us to, to understand what are the specific forms of politics that are played by uh, and performed by architecture. And we've been looking, for instance, at the way bodies uh, are kind of becoming public spaces, or at, the, at, or at least the tradition of public spaces moving to something that is much more embodied. Or, for instance, what are the possibilities of cosmopolitics? The whole uh, the encounter of different natures and uh, together with non-natures, and what is the way that we could in invent and somehow perform cohabitants? Or, for instance, what are the specific uh, forms of politics that are happening in domesticity now, and what are the ones that are connecting? What happens in a kitchen with uh, with environmental discussion? What happens when there's something that happens at the home that connects cells? with our, our genes 
uh, actually with the big scale of the galaxy. And these connections are really something that for me are very exciting because I've often mediated through architecture uh, or are happening by architecture, I would say. This is the work that we've been doing in the last years and whenever I look at the, the diagram, I, f I, I remember that there's a few things missing. Uh, but <laughs> so we always do <laughs> much more than what we should. But uh, what, what is important for me is that the work is very uh, heterogeneous. If you see the lowest part, like the bottom of it is works that normally would be identified as architecture, like buildings, designs, uh, uh, you know, plans, uh, projects in general terms, but all of this needed the development of many, many, many other things that are coming with it. I think architecture is very transmaterial in a way. It's not something that happens only through bricks or through steel. Uh, let's say that steel and bricks are only possible as part of a larger uh, technological mobilization, and in those mobilizations there's ideas, uh, uh, agreements, uh, fights, uh, discussions, words, sensitivities, um, environments, many, many other things that are part of architecture and that are connected to uh, the materiality of architecture. I would like to go through that, uh, uh, through these forms, three forms of politics and this uh, transmateriality of architectural devices and actions and performances uh, through three different chapters. The first one, architecture's rendered society. And I'd like to start with this photograph that I'm very fond of, because it was, I mean, the Barcelona Pavilion has been so much photographed, but its basement, uh, the, the, the part of the, of the building that is the most, the biggest one, the most important one in terms of volume, and the one that is keeping all the mechanisms of the building, it's, it had never been photographed before. This is actually one of the, but, but we see that this material is quite unique leaning on the, on, the, on the concrete of this basement of the Barcelona Pavilion, we see that there's some, something very precious about this tinted glass. And it's actually one of the glasses that was uh, cladding uh, the bottom of the lake uh, where the Colbert sculpture is. And when it, was, when it broke, basically it was removed very carefully and taken down there to the basement. This movement of things from the upper floor to the basement, for me, I'm fascinated with it. What makes people do the effort of taking a piece of glass, a broken piece, a piece of glass, and taking it through the staircase to the basement, and why it needs to be kept there in the basement? This is Gata Niebla. Uh, <laughs> I've been studying Gata Niebla. She died last year, very sadly. Uh, but, but I studied Gata Niebla for five years, actually. <laughs> Gata Niebla is the, is, the, is the product and the, the inhabitant and the producer uh, at the same time of the, of the pavilion. So when we see uh, the Colbert sculpture, so many people have discussed the, the fact that the pavilion is producing subjects. But Gata Niebla is really the, the, the fog cat, would be the translation probably, or the cat fog, uh, is actually produced by the pavilion. It's living in the pavilion, and it's the one that is making sure that in the basement of the pavilion and in the upper floor, there's no mice. So actually, <laughs> the ecosystem of the pavilion is produced in part uh, by Gata Niebla. This is another photograph of the basement. And I'm very, very uh, excited to see that even though those pieces of travertine are no longer uh, good enough to be in the upper part, they are very carefully kept down there. So it looks a little bit like a lily high uh, uh, setting. Actually, the, even the numbers are the ones that maybe Miss van der Rohe and Lily Reich uh, would have chosen. So there's something that connects culturally, emotionally, bodily, the upper part with the basement that goes beyond any, any explanation. <laughs> uh, this is the curtain that, uh, this is a curtain in the upper part. When it started to do like this, it was taken down to the basement. So the basement is playing a, a key like here. <laughs> But this is the first one that was going through that trip, basically. This is the one that was removed from the reconstruction of the pavilion from the 80s. And you see that this one is much more, this is much more heavier than this one. 
the one, uh, the one hanging there now is much lighter because this one, the first one, was too heavy and removed the anchors of the guide from the plaster. So basically, we see here the result of an, of an experimental process, a process of tentative design that had nothing to do with the possibility of moving ideas from Miss van der Rohe's uh, brain directly into, into matter. Uh, there's the mediation of a whole industrial sex, uh, society that, is, that keeps transforming the pavilion. And even though they tried to make it look like if it was the same pavilion that was opened by Miss van der Rohe and Alfonso Trece on the morning, on the, on the morning, of, on the May morning of 1929, the whole pavilion is now different because the pavilion depends on industry, it depends on experimentation, it depends on aging materials, it depends on many things that need to be preserved in the upper part of it. This was an instant frozen moment that didn't require society to be produced. The pavilion in a way, the upper floor and the section, the, 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 the basement, are a little bit like the portrait, the picture of Dorian Gray that needs to be somehow so a few things in the basement so we can preserve this kind of fiction that architects and myself love in a way. Uh, this is the basement as it was being constructed and this is the basement now. This is precisely what is behind the Colbe sculpture. Actually the photograph was a little bit uh, not from the same, same position but the columns should be underneath uh, the Colbe sculpture. And this is the place for instance where the employees of the pavilion have lunch. They're not allowed to have lunch in the upper floor, but they are reconstructing their kind of emiation uh, collage, uh, not that different to the ones that Miss was doing after he completed uh, uh, the pavilion. So for me, there's something cultural that is connecting this, this kind of a spirit uh, that is uh, linking the two things together. And still, there was a huge effort on making or keeping the two parts divided. This is the staircase that connects the upper floor with the basement. When we look at this sign, it normally would mean that the design was not that good, <laughs> that the architects didn't, good, didn't do a good job and actually they didn't get the, uh, a license to use the basement. But actually, what is very striking to me is that th this was the result of a very intended design. Ignacio de Sola Morales, Cristian Sirisi, and Fernando Ramos, the architects who designed the the, the reconstruction of the Barcelona Pavilion, at one point were very scared that the new director could come and use the, the basement as an exhibition space that could explain the upper part. And in order to make it impossible, they decided to, to, to prove or to design the pavilion so it could be director proofed somehow. <laughs> they embedded in the design this, this device that could never, it's a, a super uh, poorly designed staircase that could never get the license for visitors to go to the, to the, to the uh, basement. And then uh, the, the basement was kept forever as kind of this invisible domain uh, for, uh, to make invisible the parts of the pavilion that would deny the possibility of frozen in, of freezing uh, the morning of 1929. I would like now to see in detail these boxes here. This is a part of the pavilion. Actually, this is the room that is used by the gardener. And what is very interesting for me about this is that these boxes, these glass boxes, were meant to reprogram the ecosystem of the pavilion. This is a photograph from uh, 1929, and you see that in the big lake, there were these water lilies that were crucial to keep the water clean, and that were, as those that are familiar with the work of Ms. van der Rohe know, they were very common in the work of Miss van der Rohe. There was a huge debate about uh, water lilies in Germany at that time. And of course, if you see, for instance, the Tugendhat, uh, they had a specific place for water lilies. So water lilies were part of Miss van der Rohe architecture. But somehow, the architects who did the reconstruction, literally, when I was interviewing them, they would say that they didn't see them that they would see the photographs and they would never realize that there were plants there. They thought it was an accident, that it was just part of the decoration that someone brought for the opening. This is the way they reconstructed the, they reconstructed the lake. And actually, the way they did it made it impossible uh, with, with this filtering and the pure, the, like a swimming pool machinery system, uh, would make it impossible now to grow water lilies. So the gardener, 
At one point, when people started to ask about the water lilies, decided to go into an experiment and place in some glass boxes with fresh water in the middle of the chlorine pond. And they, he would try to, to grow the, the water lilies himself there. But the water lilies would grow. And when a leaf would reach the chlorine the water, the whole plant would die. For me, this is a very exciting moment. Because we see that architecture is, ne is, is there's no way to fix architecture. Architecture is something that is permanently being experimented. It's a materiality that depends on the capacity of a society to keep enacting architecture day after day and make it evolve according to, to the different ways of thinking. This is somehow, for me, a beautiful image of Miss van der Rohe, a one that is capturing many things that could never be found in the upper floor. His interest on the, uh, this, the evolution of water in his architecture, his interest of bringing plants as part of architecture, many, many things that were erased from the reconstruction but that are very present in the, in the basement. This is the, uh, where Gata Niebla lives. This is where <laughs> she's been, she has spent almost her entire life in the dark of the basement. I mean, I switch, off, uh, switch on the, fo the, 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 the lights to, to, to take this picture, but basically she would be in the dark. And this is Cata Niebla, and by being in the dark, she developed uh, um, atrophia macular. Uh, so Cata Niebla was, uh, and she was no longer, when I, when I met her, she was no longer able to see anything. So she was navigating the pavilion without seeing Miss Van der Rohe's work. So whereas, <laughs> If we all are blind to the basement, we're basement, basement blind. Uh, Gata Niebla was Miss Blind. <laughs> but for me, it's very interesting that she was uh, embodying three different roles. She was somehow ignoring Miss, at the same time that she was producing Miss, and at the same time that she was produced very much by the notion of that we architects have about Miss, <laughs> that is about this kind of clean Miss that requires a basement with a cat that, that kills the, the mice, basically. <laughs> and that's what I think architecture does. In a way, we're all kind of audience, the audience of architecture. At the same time, we're producing architecture, but at the same time, we're, uh, uh, we're also produced by architecture. And I think these three roles are overlap in a way that uh, uh, are, in my opinion, kind of the center of the discussion of architecture. Uh, this is the, what we did. Basically, what we did was messed up this distinction to bring things from the uh, basement up, upstairs uh, to, for instance, make it needed for the, the people, uh, the curators, to ask the, the cleaning staff if they could use the, if, the, if that, that was a good way of putting the vacuum cleaner to basically subvert through the organization of, uh, of to the, the way objects were distributed between the upper floor and the, the basement, the whole structure of power that was happening in the pavilion. And this is kind of what I'm trying to do. This is what the Office for Political Innovation is trying to do. We try to intervene on existing situations, shaking, uh, subverting, uh, reverting, revolting, uh, challenging, or making evolve uh, uh, ongoing power structures. This is, for instance, the distribution of contemporary art centers in Madrid. They're all in a very particular area, but this one that I will tell you about afterwards. Um, and this is the distribution of the, at one point, most active places where art and culture was happening in Madrid, and it was a very different distribution. But these people were never invited, actually, to these uh, centers. So at one point, we were invited to, to do an intervention in the, in the big square of the old slot, slaughterhouse that had been transformed into a cultural center. And we decided to propose to do these devices that we call the Scarabox, like a, a mixture of uh, beetles and, and, uh, and uh, voice-giving devices. Uh, that would be movable devices that could provide shade, the main thing that was required from us uh, by the clients, this institution. But uh, by using irrigation systems, uh, uh, structures that were really cheap uh, because they were, they were mass produced, we found a way to reassemble existing components and have an extra part of the budget that we could use to re-equip or to provide uh, an extra plus of equipment to these shading devices. And uh, these things were basically uh, computers, 
projectors, speakers, lighting systems, additional furniture, rolling furniture, we would call it because it could also move around. Uh, these are the scatterbox being used uh, in the square. And at one point, this was in Matadero, became a laboratory for architecture. And this was uh, by far the, 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 the smallest project that was developed there. But it was the one that created actually the biggest audience. So during the summer, there's a, an average of 500 people that come here. And what is very interesting for me, it's not only the number of people, but the huge amount of, and they're available for people to use them without being invited. And what for me is interesting is that it became a place, for instance, where uh, this is, for instance, a derby of independent magazines that was organized there. And this is, for instance, a knife, uh, <laughs> knife uh, throwing or whatever, uh, a spectacle. This uh, possibility of somehow develop a, an infrastructure or a, pub, a, a version of public space that could be equipped with systems that could connect a society that is happening online with a society, the society that is happening offline, for instance, one that is uh, uh, somehow just expecting to have fun with one that uh, is uh, challenging culture or politics is what, for me, was interesting about this project. The capacity of transforming the way different networks of the city were uh, be, being connected through a material device, a very uh, kind of tiny and small in terms of material mobilization device that somehow could uh, intervene all these networks. Something very different is, for instance, one of the last projects that we completed is uh, Romola, which is basically a restaurant for a very experimental chef that we did in Madrid. Uh, at the time that uh, Madrid is suffering this invasion of hipster uh, bars and restaurants and <laughs> that are all made of uh, recycled wood and, you know, uh, old furniture. Well, you know, what can I tell you? <laughs> this global hipster style. But what is really interesting is that basically that style that looks so austere, which, what, which all the, the implications that has in Europe, is actually leaving behind all the artisans' network in Madrid, people that were uh, not that much uh, recycling wood, but were uh, using leather, marble, gold, metal. And for us, <laughs> it was quite of a provocation to, see, to say that that environment that was very much uh, catering to or serving France, big franchises, big companies, big brands that were opening places everywhere was really not the the progressive way of doing things, and it was probably much more interesting to look at all these material traditions that in the past were perceived as very luxurious, but now they're very much attached of, of uh, labor, of structures of labor, and networks of artisans that are disappearing and that are uh, being replaced by um, people that are working, or by uh, structures that are promoting a way of working that is based on precarity, on, uh, well, you know, what can I tell you? But, but what we did, we worked with amazing engineers from uh, back, and we decided to do this a little bit like a back Mr. Fuller experiment. And we were using marble actually in its capacity for, for compression, and we were uh, doing a little bit of a tensegrity structure hanging it, which ended up being very, very appreciated by some people, but there's many clients that are leaving messages like, I want eat in that restaurant again. I'm super scared that the marble is, can, is killing me the next time. <laughs> and it's something similar in this series of uh, architectures uh, as rendered societies, ways for architecture, architectural action to basically subvert the way societies constituted and trying to find ways to rearticulate in uh, existing networks. Uh, we, were we were asked to to think of a way to intervene in a, or to think of a suburban house in Ibiza. And uh, at the time that Ibiza was uh, very heavily being constructed, uh, we, we were working together with a number of activists to find ways for this sort of constructions to do a prototype of a house that could make it compatible, the hedonistic life uh, that the Ibiza uh, dwellers are looking for in a way with, uh, environmental, with the environmental wealth of a very particular valley, Calabadella, that was uh, in which a number of experiments of housing were happening in which uh, the possibility of bringing together nature 
with uh, nature, with, with uh, the hedonistic life of these newcomers uh, was not even being discussed. Uh, these are the plans that we did, and uh, for me, drawing is something that has a political meaning. Uh, we very carefully draw the geometry of the trees, the paths of the animals that were going through the, uh, through the, through the valley, the, the paths of the, of the ground that were permeable. Uh, we draw them together with the life uh, that was being introduced here. And the geometry of the house was both registering all these requirements of the, all, all the requirements of things that needed to be preserved and be kept there, and all the things that need, were somehow requested to be brought in. This capacity of architecture to reassemble uh, different natures is, in a way, what I was very interested on when we were doing this this work. And uh, yeah. But the house, of course, uh, became kind of a nightmare. This is, for instance, a number of models that we did to, to rethink the structure. Uh, you, well, there's no need to tell you how many nightmares uh, or the nightmare that it was to construct it at one point, uh, but this is the way, the way it looks, and it's been already there for, for a while, and actually it's, things are growing, and the, the, the animals are, keep, are kept there, the permeability of the ground is being maintained. Uh, actually, the, the, the services were, and the mechanisms were introduced in this bunker to prevent uh, any spall to happen on the ground. Um, okay, number two. Multiplying the spectrum of the possible. Uh, this is actually, uh, well, this, these things I have a certain uh, obsession with years. Uh, and this is uh, from 1956, uh, Georgi Kepes, uh, uh, the, new landscape of, uh, the New Landscape in Art and Science. Uh, and for me, it's quite uh, exciting. The whole tradition or the whole, uh, the way architecture is uh, historically uh, been bringing together science with politics, with form, with aesthetics. Uh, if we had to pay attention to a particular moment in which architecture was designing daily life in a radical way and mobilizing, especially mobilizing science as the language with which architecture would speak, probably would be <laughs> this one. And, um, and I'm very interested on the frame and what is in the frame. Uh, of course, everyone knows 1977, uh, Powers of Ten. Uh, and the Eames uh, have been framing, I mean, framing is their thing. Uh, I think that all these photographs are about a, a couple, a very particular couple made by, or that is made this distinction between a man and a woman, being brought together by love, probably, uh, and framed by architecture. <laughs> And the imps were really obsessed about frames, I think, and they were framing the social, not only themselves, but they were framing others. So uh, Powers of Time cannot be seen without acknowledging that it was super popular, that it was distributed everywhere, and that probably all of you have seen it in the same way that I've seen it. Uh, if we look at the origins of Powers of Ten, is probably this book, Cosmic View, The Universe in 40 Jumps, that is, again, from one year later than Georgie Kepes' work, 1957. So there was something happening in 56, 57 that was about science, daily life, uh, and architecture, in a way. Chris Buke uh, is not that much being studied, and I'm very surprised that, uh, that the, the discussion of the images never found Kiss Book Booker that, that intensively. Actually, Kiss Booker was uh, the inventor of a very particular notion of democracy that was really literally not a democracy. Uh, he was proposing to move from a, a representation-based democracy to a democracy that was basically uh, sociocracy, as he called it, that meant that the opinion of the majority would be imposed uh, to the rest of the population. <laughs> a very particular <laughs> idea <laughs> that he defended uh, through his book, uh, his 1945 book, Democracy as It Should Be. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so, well, this is Kiss Buke uh, with, uh, with his partner, uh, Betty Cadbury. And Betty Cadbury is super important here because when he was thinking of uh, good cities, he was thinking of Cadbury City, a town hall that Betty's father designed and constructed for his employees at Cadbury Chocolate Factory. Uh, so Bernbull Village 
was not really a village, it was actually a trust. And uh, the idea that there could be a management system that could run society on behalf of those that were constituting society was very much the idea of sociocracy, the idea of uh, eliminating diversity through consensus. Um, when we look at the language of the IMS, uh, there's the invention of the Zoom, of course, the 1956 Again, of course, the same year. Actually, I think Georgie Kepes was doing a Zoom. At the same time, the engineer was uh, designing the famous Zoom that was taken to the moon and was traveling to everywhere and was traveling to LA uh, to the Emesis offices and was used uh, to suit uh, powers of 10. But when we look at the Zoom inside, uh, it's something very particular. It's actually, you know, the, the case, the black case of the, of the Zoom is hiding the huge diversity of lenses that are needed to produce this illusion of non-discontinuity. This capacity of the lenses to move from one to another without, without being perceived depends on an architecture that is framing it as a black box, uh, hiding, like the, the Barcelona basement, the whole social complexity that is needed for, to move from one scale to another, to move from genes to bodies, or from grass to galaxies, or from grass to the control, well, from lawns and, and, and green, to the control of a whole territorial uh, expansion. All those, that complexity, the need to hide it, is also uh, in the way Powers of Ten was designed. This is one of the, uh, one of the sketches of the storyboard, of the first version of the storyboard from 1968. It's very interesting that someone erased it here, virus. Uh, this is a photograph that someone took from a scientific book. They were actually trying to, to see cells. They were only collecting the beautiful pictures uh, that they would find in science books. But then someone, said, someone found at one point, but do you know what is happening here? Uh, this is a cell that is being attacked by a virus that is injecting its DNA in the nucleus of the cell and is actually invading it. This is kind of a drama that is happening to this cell. <laughs> and basically, this was the moment that this photograph, uh, this photogram was removed from the story. So, the, 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 so Powers of Ten is actually that much a project of inclusion. What is that that is inside the frame? as a huge project of inclusion in which, for instance, virus, diseases, disabilities, other forms of technology, other countries were never included in that frame. This is the work that we did, uh, that Amal was mentioning, that was presented in the first time in Lisbon here. Uh, actually, there's some people here that were <laughs> there that day. And that was repeated in uh, Chicago, and then it traveled to Mexico and many other places. Uh, in Chicago, actually, it was very exciting because it was uh, the place where the picnic was supposed to happen. And what we were trying to do is a scientific uh, experiment, basically using theater as a way to reproduce the zooming dynamic uh, to prove that it was basically impossible, that there was no way to have a picnic and then <laughs> remove yourself from the picnic and see the grass or the lawn. Uh, we were trying to do a very basic experiment, reproducing, reenacting the movie, so we could see that it basically didn't work. Uh, but there was another level. When we were looking at the story, there were so many things that were missing. For instance, the fact that Philip Morrison uh, was actually, his, if his body uh, was the one placed in the center, we would probably have virus. He was suffering from polio, and polio made him be in a wheelchair at the end of his life. He was all his life li uh, living with uh, disease and with uh, uh, what was perceived by others by uh, disabilities. And, uh, but that was not, of course, in the, in the movie. Or for instance, the fact that Philip Morrison was the one placing the A-bomb in the, in, the, in, the, in the plane that lived to, Naga to Hiroshima in a move that actually was also an inter-escalar project of making something very small expand. Uh, but of course, the peaceful scene in the picnic was not reproducing or including the whole violence that the Cold War was uh, keeping there in that scene. Uh, or for instance, uh, the fact that, that uh, 
that Philip Morrison, uh, even though he says, oh, the galaxy is so empty, his voice, the one, he's the one, the scientist that is giving voice, the, is the voice over in the movie, uh, even though he says uh, the galaxy is so empty, what is full and lively are our neighborhoods. But actually he was believing that we, could, we human could get in touch with aliens. And he actually, his ideas that were published in Nature, of course, again in, uh, in 1957, uh, like everything else, um, were the base for the construction of these antennas. And Mark is the, the expert on, on antennas, of antennas. And this antenna that was actually, uh, uh, in 1977, the very year that Powers of Ten was released, was getting this message from the outer space, uh, the wow message that was proving that there was a possibility for humans to communicate with aliens. But we could go on and on. For instance, the grass, the, the lawn there was basically the moment that Brilliant was patented by Monsanto, uh, what was called at that time a, subor a, suburban, a, a suburban dream. Uh, by the New York Times, because basically uh, it was growing very slow, so you didn't have to, to take care of it. Uh, but of course it was reducing, even though the president, the CEO of, of Monsanto at that time said, we're, ju we're just creating superior species, uh, it was basically removing the huge biodiversity of all suburban contexts in, in uh, the US. Or for instance, the film that was used uh, to shoot, or to, to shoot the, the, the film was uh, Kodachron that was calibrated with these Cindy cards that were taken from this uh, super uh, uh, white skin uh, woman and that were basically making it impossible for uh, people of different skin tones to be reproduced by Kodak for decades. Actually, since very recent, it was really very difficult to calibrate Kodak films uh, when shooting people that were not uh, similar to, to Cindy. So all this, and of course, when we go, the most critical moment probably, uh, it's the moment that uh, the movie gets closer to the hand, and it goes to the, the hand of this guy, of course, and it goes to the genes, all the way to the genes, and there's a direct identification of genes and gender. At the time that, of course, in LA, the discussion of transgender realities uh, was huge. This was already, of course, in, the, in 52, but this is in 53, and this is, in, uh, uh, um, this is what we did, uh, basically bring uh, many of these long-term activists and reenact the movie with them, uh, like in this case in Chicago. So these are what we call the superpowers of them. All these other presences that were not in the frame that Seeing now backwards what Powers of Ten was, we see that probably is an agenda for contemporary architecture. An agenda that has to do with technology, that has to do with nature, that has to do with environments, that has to do with corporations, that has to do with forms of politics. And somehow, I would propose that this is a radical interior design project that somehow we wanted to inhabit that as designers. And that's why we're there, actually. <laughs> uh, but also it was inhabited by others. And that is for me very important. This is the, the, the use that, it, that Bruno Latour gave to this uh, radical interior design. And for me it's very important that the discussions that we architects in our field are having are something that could connect us with others. And that are something that could help others also understand the political dimension of the time that we're living. So the questions, for instance, that uh, some of you were having before about the way design connects to politics and the way that uh, that is uh, connected to design, uh, I would say that the, the, many of the decisions, many of the calibrations, many of the dimensions, the aesthetics, the technologies, the materialities that we mobilize to architectural practices are really embodying already a big part of the conflicts that our societies are discussing. Okay, this is, another, uh, this is another version of the same. This is, I could say the same probably with this. This is a Catholic uh, a seminar, of, uh, a kind of a minor seminar was called, that these photographs is in the 1950s were a big part of the priests that were, uh, uh, that were later 
uh, operating in the south of Europe were at one point being educated. It was a huge institution that was built in the 15th century uh, in this palace that you see behind. And that, uh, as you see, was not only an architecture of walls and bricks and stones, but in the 50s, when this photograph was taken, uh, was also an architecture of uh, training and exercise. Uh, but actually, everyone's doing exercise at the same time, and all the bodies seem to be responding to the same criteria. The one of probably this person that probably at, uh, is also controlled by another one, and uh, probably there's a kind of super centralized, there was a super centralized way of uh, controlling the production of bodies through architecture. And architecture, I insist on this, was a key player here. Uh, this is, for instance, the design of the rooms where the children were sleeping in the 50s. And as you see, they had no doors, and they were organized so a priest could go all around during the night watching what was happening in those places. So for me, what is very interesting is that the whole project of transforming the life of these people, their bodies, uh, also transforming the way Europe was operating ideologically was very much constructed through architectural calibrations, design calibrations that somehow uh, were what we were invited to, to challenge when we won the competition to transform uh, this building from being a seminar, a minor seminar, into a residence for elder priests that were coming back after being living their life as uh, or priests uh, elsewhere. When we look at the building, the building was very much uh, designed. I mean, there was this 15th century uh, part of it, the uh, 19th century extension, and then we were re transforming all this and adding a new part here. Uh, but basically, our work consisted on rethinking the way this building would relate to the rest of the city, the city of Placentia. We were actually designing this garden for the people in, living here to relate to all these neighbors. We were producing this other place here underneath that we cannot see here, this one here, to invite people that are coming here to share a space with them. We were actually providing a direct as access to the chapel, so what happened in the chapel could be shared by the neighbors as well. So the whole design was um, uh, trying to bring porosity into a design that so far had been so close. Uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the neighbors. But from what for me was most interesting was a collection of political toys that we introduced here and there to make it possible that the for the people living here, people like this, to take decisions on the way the building would perform in their daily life. Uh, I will tell you only about one of them. For instance, at one point, we decided to divide the garden into different parts uh, and give one of these parts, like one of these lots, to one of the people living, to each of the people of the persons living here in the, in the house. Uh, this is what happened a year later. This is, uh, this guy here uh, was actually becoming a big uh, land operator in the, in the Placentia clergy house. He had convinced a number of his friends to, to let him take care of their lots, and he's here uh, watching us because the lot was in the middle of a big dispute. This is actually the reconstruction of the dispute because this guy has decided to grow onions in his piece of land and, uh, you know, and there was a huge controversy of the people living here in this area that they, they thought it was very vulgar to have onions at the entrance of the, of the clergy house. Uh, so he teamed up with other people to support his onion project uh, the other people started to grow flowers at the entrance, uh, so they mobilized flowers as a, as a political tool uh, to make it clear what their position was. Uh, then this guy made it a big a thing about sharing the onions with everyone, and he would be organizing dinners uh, with others. And then they did the ultimate move. They brought an expert a neighbor that was a professional gardener that was asked if onions was a good idea here in the garden and she said, she certified that onions were not uh, the proper way to, uh, to receive people in the garden of the clergy house. So for me, what is important is that uh, architecture can be a political ground. 
an arena in which daily life controversies could be channeled and in which actually the design could promote forms of rendering the social that are not necessarily consensual, are not like this picnic uh, of the images in which basically difference and minorities are removed, but are, it's possible, for instance, people like this lady that was in the flower part, uh, not to speak to these people, but still sharing the same infrastructure and being part of the same party. This is something that we're trying to do now at other scales with projects like this. This is uh, in Vasby in Sweden, uh, where there's a huge lack of housing at this point, and we're uh, developing a project, a housing project that for a thousand apartments uh, that is uh, basically trying to uh, provide an infrastructure that could capture the diversity that the, the, the Vasby society is made of. Or for instance, this project that we're in the middle of doing now, uh, that was basically a transformation of an existing contemporary art museum. Uh, we won the competition proposing not to demolish the museum, but to propose a, pro a, 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 a transformation, a progressive transformation, a step by step uh, of the existing building that was a very kind of ugly and not interesting building that, that, but, but was possible to transform into, and to uh, reprogram. And the advantage of not demolishing the project and doing a new one is that we could do that without closing the museum. And, the progress, and each step of the transformation could be an, uh, an opportunity for artists to intervene and actually uh, a possibility for the museum to rediscuss what their audience was. So a museum that is starting uh, with a very conventional uh, audience, a very limited one, during the course of the transformation, for instance, this is the moment that we demolished this, uh, this uh, house that was actually inside the museum and was preventing this space to being very flexible. But then we did it at a, uh, in a way that the first thing that would happen even before we finished the transformation of this part of the building was that Sergio Prego could do this amazing inflate inflatable ex, uh, installation, and that invited new publics to come to the museum. So the, the whole process of transformation was open, was um, black boxed as an opportunity for the museum to gain new audiences. And for instance, this is the, probably the case, this is the, one of the parts that is already finished, that is this, uh, this uh, 25 meter tall uh, multifunctional space that we designed basically by removing things that were there that was recently transformed into this sort of TV set that was used to bring bogging uh, into the museum. And for three months now, this has been the way the museum has been operating every day. And that has been an opportunity to invite many people that were operating around the museum and that were doing all these things in the street and use the museum as a platform uh, to gain a, a connection with many of the debates that were already happening. Uh, so for us, this is again a way of challenging the way architecture frames society. An opportunity to intervene on already existing structures uh, to, give it, to make it possible for a museum like this to have an inflatable structure that would bring architects, for instance, and a few days later, later being transformed in this kind of uh, uh, showcase or run, uh, runway where a big thing, a big part of what is happening in the street could be installed in the center of the museum. And the third one is about New York. We're in New York, and I think we have to keep discussing New York once and again. And I would like to, to discuss New York um, and the possibility of, or the dispute that is happening now in New York, uh, I, I would call it views in, in dispute, visibility in dispute, uh, who sees in dispute. And my proposal that would be an architecture that is uh, bringing difference and is, is capable of assemblage different. Okay, this is 432. Uh, this is something that probably many of you uh, have worked on in the studios that we, we did here, in, or that I did here in, in Colombia together with, with Eduardo, with Rui. Uh, but for me, 432 is some sort of a, a question mark to our profession. Uh, when we look at this image, of course, uh, it's a very elegant structure, very, very much related to a big part of architectural modern tradition. It looks a little bit like a Hoffman uh, object, uh, but uh, it's also related to many things that are happening to New York, and it's not only critical, things that are not only critically in, critical 
in terms of social justice, but are also critical in the way that we as professionals can imagine and can propose good things, uh, exciting things, beautiful things to happen in a place like New York. Uh, these are some of the renderings that uh, D-Box did uh, to start selling these apartments. And for me, D-Box is key here to understand what is the political performance of uh, this uh, building. Uh, when we see this, an image like this, we see that 80% of what is depicted here is the sky. And actually, it's quite a blue sky. Uh, of course, this building is related to many other layers of design. For instance, the way uh, the economy of New York was transformed uh, after the, uh, the, 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 the loss of importance of the harbor, uh, uh, when the the ship, the, the ship cargo of uh, the ship container harbor in Elizabeth was built, um, what was the way that the economy progressively moved to, into a direction that eventually could be expressed through this Bloomberg uh, sentence? Uh, if we bring all the, as many billionaires as possible, it would be a, a godsend. Uh, that translated, of course, in legal innovations. Uh, that ended up like the new, like uh, like uh, Louis uh, Louis Story uh, research or uh, wrote for the New York Times in figures like this: six seventy seven uh, percent of the properties in uh, Times Warner Towers being uh, uh, bought or acquired through LLC shell companies that were hiding who was behind the property and therefore it became an opportunity to launder money in many cases. But that is something that was already. Uh, also translated into architectural design, and architecture was part of that. This is the first rendering that D-Box produced, in which basically the architecture is described, or the action, the agency of architecture, as a tiny filtering uh, between the existing sky, the existing atmosphere, and the one that would be perceived from the apartments in this super well-known chair. Um, but actually, that's not something that was only happening in the space of imagination and fantasy of the renderings, uh, but this, uh, the renderings were totally real, as it proves that they were totally connected to the, to the architectural materiality. This is the most expensive part of the building that was the glass, basically, that was brought from Austria, and that is a very particular glass that is polarizing the blue part of the spectrum of the light, uh, making the sky look much more blue, as you see here. Uh, but that was not only, uh, this was not only a pr project that was happening at the scale of the glass. It was also a territorial project, a project about pollution distribution, because the pollution that was removed uh, th those years uh, through the uh, Clean Heat uh, Act uh, that the Bloomberg administration promoted to make uh, people use gas, natural gas, in, as, as the fuel of their heating systems was basically forcing uh, the pollution that previously was in Manhattan to move to another place, namely to Susquehanna Valley, where, fr where fracking was growing at the same speed that um, the use of other oils, uh, of other sources of energy were uh, going down in New York. Actually, the same year, or the year after, 2013, that the uh, Clean Heat Act was approved uh, in Manhattan, uh, the, the extraction of natural gas in the whole state of Manhattan was banned. And it was actually the moment in which Susquehanna Valley started to be, to be seen uh, uh, increasing uh, the pollution in its air, as much as, of course, the pollution of its water. This is the way uh, the sensors that are placed in the uh, drill uh, bits of the uh, fracking uh, devices of the riggings uh, are collecting information in 4D platforms that are consolidating all the, the, the data that is taken through these sensors that are placed in the, in the drilling bits. For me, this is very interesting because this is the actual image, the actual view that also is related to the view of uh, D-Box from 432. Somehow, the extraction of this gas, the possibility of moving the production of energy to Susquehanna Valley and therefore moving in the land the, the uh, pollution that is very much uh, related to the living conditions that are provided in a place like New York depends on the production of, of, of uh, uh, information and information platforms are the one that we see here. 
And somehow, these are also the views that uh, the 432 are looking at. Of course, in a very uh, David and Goliath <laughs> scale relationship, we were trying to respond to this. So we were trying to do a little bit of a manifesto through an architectural design that could respond to the way toxicity which was dealt with in New York City. This is uh, Cosmo, the project that we did for uh, the MoMA PS1 as part of the uh, Young Architects Project competition. And this is the way it was already placed here in, uh, in the courtyard of PS1. Cosmo was a device that was responding to the capacity of the city to remove its pollution and take it to somewhere else, or to take it somewhere else like Susquehanna, by keeping it there, but basically providing a circulation of images in which people were parting around toxicity, in which people would be really lighted by shit uh, uh, in a very art particular of different um, a aesthetic uh, uh, project that was somehow contesting the very uh, particular and abstract images that were produced by D-Box. Uh, and it was also responding to the way that the infrastructures that are dealing with the treatment of water in New York City are uh, not that much designed uh, to be seen like this, but to actually be seen like this. So basically to be not reachable, not discussed, not inhabited, secured by this area around it. Um, and we were proposing to basically do the opposite, to decentralize uh, the treatment of waste, to bring it to the city, to make it something that could be cohabiting with the nice things that we enjoy about New York City, and to even do it in a way that could be uh, nice or, oh, and a, oh, this is not moving. Well, it should, we should be jumping. This is Cosmo. Uh, it basically was uh, learning from many of the experiments that were happening in the 60s by people like John Todd. It was taking water from the sewage system uh, directly, uh, it was making it circulate through a number of ecosystems, through a number of gardens. Uh, so after two weeks, you could drink the water. But it was doing it in a way that the uh, process was on black box. It was engineered and it was curated so people could understand it, could follow the, the movement of the water, the way it could reach the algae bags here, uh, the way it would go back to the tanks, the way the fishes were actually eating things in the water. Uh, in a way, uh, this was uh, un black box in a process that normally we never get to see. And not only that, but, that, but was only doing it in a way that was perceived as a garden, as something that you could inhabit, that you could enjoy, that you could be part of. This is the way it looked from above. This is the way it functioned. So it was a very performative architecture that where the water was circulating and at one point was also sensed and was conveying through uh, an app what was the evolution of the quality of the water. But for me what is very important is was that it was also an opportunity for people to enjoy, to party. It was somehow uh, the excuse to bring people together uh, to cohabit with toxicity. Uh, <laughs> ah, okay, here we're jumping. Cosme is ready to party. And with this, I finish with my three proposals to politicize architectural practices. Thank you so much. You give us, uh, you know, hope. Um, but one of the things that, that I think came, you know, came about in the conversation, you know, right before with um, some of the students was, uh, uh, and, and it has to do with uh, two, two different ways of, you know, thinking uh, about architecture. You know, uh, one one way um, is uh, the world is just too complex. Mm -hmm. Life is too messy. We gotta like you know uh, render architecture this kind of autonomous oh, thing you. that is you know p pure and 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 the kind of act of form making and 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 what I again kind of r sort of was reminded in in seeing the talk is that in your in your work. Um, it's bring it, 
bring it all, <laughs> you know, just just bring it all in. There's the sense that uh, you can engage with complexity, you can engage with the messiness of life, not just what we think we see, mm. but what, what we, mm -hmm. we don't see. And, and sort of, you know, an architecture can not only absorb all of it, but come out of that mm -hmm. uh, even stronger, right? <laughs> as, a, as a sort of uh, re-energized um, um, device for, for mm -hmm. life, for mm -hmm. staging life. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's the kind of optimistic part, you know, anyone who said, you know, this is um, a way to kill architecture, you're like, no, 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 this is a way to make sure architecture lives, literally, as in, as in, as in Cosmo. Um, and some of the ways that you, you kind of sort of perform that uh, resuscitation or mm -hmm. constant kind of, uh, of architecture is through narrative and, mm -hmm. and basically engaging with that unbelievable complexity. I mean, just the speed of your, <laughs> you know, uh, presentation is, is just kind of bringing all these things together. Um, but also tracing materiality. I, I think yeah. materiality um, plays a, a very uh, important role in your work, not just as a kind of aesthetic dimension, but as both aesthetic and a register yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, of the processes that, mm -hmm. that, that kind of architecture uh, mob mobilizes. And so I wanted to talk a little bit um, ab about these two things, narrative and, and materiality, and, and, and finally, uh, representation. Mm -hmm. You mentioned drawing um, and uh, and the kind of ways in which you put these thoughts together, um, either on paper or literally as a kind of performance. Uh, and somehow these pieces are at times a network of parts and then get assembled, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes. So just mm -hmm. kind of opening up the ways in which you are um, engaging complexity mm -hmm. uh, somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, for me, the discussion of uh, uh, whether architecture should forget about uh, the world and concentrate on very disciplinary uh, operations or to engage, I, I think needs to be reconstructed because it's precisely by, en by engaging in very particular disciplinary questions why or the way architecture really relates to, to uh, the world and becomes also a compulsory passing point of many of the realities that, were, that are shaping our lives and our connections with other things. For instance, I think that uh, in the case of the images or in the case of the water, or in the case, there's always particular issues that are very technical. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the, the selection of the glass in this mm -hmm. uh, tower, for me is crucial because uh, it makes very clear that architecture is not uh, neutral is really inventing that possibility. And in the same way, the, the, the transformation of, this, of the, uh, the way New York deals with the waste mm -hmm. is something that is very technical. It's not, uh, not that much of an uh, ideological thing. It's very material, very much done mm -hmm. through architectural tools. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think that if you revert it, it could be really so fun, mm -hmm. and it could be very beautiful, and it could include other realities, and it could. So our architecture is also about making it possible to uh, produce a situation that is attracting and is reconstructing society through enrollment. And I think that goes with criticality mm -hmm. at the same time. So the capacity of architecture to become also a tool for uh, society to transform the way we together monitor daily life, monitor realities. Uh, it's also related to this capacity of architecture to deploy aesthetic strategies and ways of dealing with information. So for, that's why I think that in, in our discipline, uh, the discussion of whether architecture being political or not being political, it's a little bit simplified. Mm -hmm. I, I would like really to, to be part of a discussion in which we can go very much into the details mm -hmm. now. And we can say, okay, architecture is political. Right. Now it's about thinking what kind of politics mm -hmm. we want architecture mm -hmm. to be playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 one of the ways in uh, which I think you are pushing the sort of boundaries and expanding, but also actually almost to find architecture again, mm -hmm. right? It's always to kind of, um, is, is by basically not also drawing a distinction between design research 
mm. and, and practice. I mean, in, in your, you, you know, you sort of uh, practice as a form of research mm -hmm. and, and research as a form of practice and the two things are completely intertwined and you're moving across media and, uh, and scale and, you know, it's sort of anything that is, can be designed is mm -hmm. up for grabs as a way to mm -hmm. kind of re-enter architecture. Do you mm -hmm. think that and, and I, again, to kind of echoing some of the questions that came up earlier and some of the questions I think for our students, uh, you know, this is what architecture yeah. is today or what architects do mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, I think the, I mean, the, the idea that uh, uh, any activity uh, could survive without research, I think right. is very naive. So basically, architecture, like any other field, uh, depends on its capacity to produce uh, and mobilize and connect with, with certain forms of intelligence and, and produce its own connection to criticality. I think also that design practices are uh, not only resolving, or not, not almost never resolving problems, but uh, describing them, uh, producing platforms in which they can be understood differently, uh, creating devices that enable us to relate to them, to those uh, uh, situations differently. And in that respect, the practice of designing is not different uh, to the practice of doing research, mobilizing, infor mobilizing information, creating archives. Actually, I would say that by not looking at design as an archive, not looking at design already as something that is accumulating information, articulating it, producing discourse, we're losing a great capital of empirical knowledge mm -hmm. that architecture is producing every day. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, the, the, for instance, the, the idea of looking at the Barcelona Pavilion in itself uh, as an architecture and exploring it through the tools of design was crucial because then we could, or I could see together with other people, we could see in group things that were very much embedded in the design, like for instance, the design of the staircase. And for me, this is very important because I think design is, at least the way I see it, a, a research practice and it's, there's no way to separate. And also an activism. I think it's a form of activism. It's a way of the, uh, intervening, existing and ongoing disputes. Yeah. But what's also interesting is that, um, you know, um, you're not only kind of writing <laughs> about the, the the kind of discoveries or that archive that you're sort of uh, unraveling, but you're intervening yeah. in it, you know, through drawing, <laughs> uh, through photography, through performance, through it's kind of mobilizing <laughs> all these <laughs> other ways and uh, um, to sort of, you, you said it yourself, to also communicate and render visible mm -hmm. to a broader audience and touch through other means and create experiences. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of the things that always strikes me about your teaching here at the school is the ways in which you know, the work of uh, the students, you know, sort of, it, 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 it has that immediately the dimension mm -hmm. of, of unbelievable drawing where the students are really connecting all these ideas <laughs> together and making them visible in these like exquisite kind of landscapes. And so I wanted to, you know, get you to talk a little bit about your kind of pedagog pedagogical yeah. approach and, and also, you know, what you think an agenda for a school like ours should be. Mm -hmm. And we talked mm -hmm. a little bit ab about that mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, in, in kind of today's sort of landscape. Somehow. Yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, I, I would say that for me, uh, I'm an architect and, uh, but the way I see architecture together with other people, it's uh, something that happens in an office when we're designing things but then in other places where we maybe do a performance, writing, uh, discussing, uh, but also teaching. I think it's all part of the same concern, the same sensitivity, and the same uh, way of engaging with, with others. Uh, the, 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 the studios that, for instance, I've been doing, or the seminars that I've done in Colombia, uh, we're very much trying to see how architecture is already uh, part of many of the most important uh, challenges that we're facing now and the ones that are shaping us and we're shaped through. 
and uh, and and I think it's uh, when you look at whatever particular uh, critical situation, architecture is always there, mm -hmm. uh, and and there and it's not any architecture; it's an architecture that somehow has been designed through many means or through uh, in the encounter of many things. So it's not only that there's uh, an architecture, but also it's an architecture that you can track somehow some actions that were influencing or contributing to, to be uh, the way it is. And, and equally, just by looking at it and starting to represent it differently and to, to bring into paper, into digital archives, into digital files, into a discussion, those realities segregated from others, uh, be, being given a name, uh, they're already mobilized differently. And then you can test what could be potential evolutions. For me, this is what I so much enjoy about pedagogy. The possibility of, together with other people, uh, looking at something that is very critical and that we feel uncomfortable with or that we don't know how to position ourselves with and started to, through architectural tools, make it emerge. And for instance, that's something that I, I see many people that were in studios, for instance, in Lanzarote, or for instance, in, the, in Rockaway, when we're looking at mm -hmm. the, the border of Rockaway, the, the way the wall between the ocean and the city is being produced, and how that wall is capturing so many conflicts. And what is the way that that was designed? What, what was, the, it, what, what was the, the, the wall the result of? And what was the, the, the way that through other uh, priorities mm -hmm. that relationship could be re-engineered and redesigned through architecture? Mm -hmm. For me, the ambition of pedagogy is that architecture can operate in those places that are important and that architectural practices are able to introduce new possibilities to multiply what is possible uh, by looking at reality very carefully and reintroducing or rethinking the way design operates there. And I think that very you know, careful attention to kind of uh, observation, right? I, <laughs> I think of your work as a kind of incredible observation and ability to, to just absorb. Um, but I, I also see it in the, in, the, in the work of the students and the drawings where that level of detail, yeah. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, it's not, it's not just a sort of beautiful drawing. It's like there's a sort of little cup on the table <laughs> drawn in the section or, you know, like they are inhabited with, yeah. with life and, and some of the conflicts that, that you're describing. And, and I think clearly, uh, you know, everyone is trying mm -hmm. to come to terms with redesigning those those relationships. Um, we talked about materiality, and mm -hmm. uh, and and so, which uh, you know, I love your new the restaurant is just uh, you know this is the hanging marble that are about to like slice the you know head of the customers. Uh, you know, a new experience for uh, for food, um, but um, you know, color. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think a couple of weeks ago with Jurgen Meyer, we talked about beige and his manifesto <laughs> for beige, which apparently he started here at the school, kind of anti-white <laughs> manifesto for beige. And so I wanted to, you know, yeah. I, I read somewhere um, that in your very, um, you know, proper Spanish education, uh, you were s scolded once for your use of unserious color. So can I you really tell <laughs> us about, you know, your um, sort yeah, of... Yeah. Color sensibility, which I, you yeah. know. Yeah, actually, when I was trained in Spain, that was a big problem for me. <laughs> I can I imagine. Because I was using colors I mean, at the time that in Spain, no one was using colors. Yeah, it yeah, it was just like, it was a nightmare. I remember that many of my teachers were, would say things like, you can use color if it's the color of the material. And I said, yeah, that's what I'm doing. It's the color of the painting. And then it's the, the, the paint is that, that color. Yeah, it's the... So, yeah, see, yeah. this is a problem. You consider paint a material. Exactly. Right? The, yeah. But the paint was not counting as material. Yeah. And, uh, and, but it's, and for instance, when we did the Placentia Clergy House, it was so funny because we did it and everyone... Uh, and then we were selected for the for the Spanish biennial and then the, the Latin American biennial, something like that. And then there was a huge uh, number of people that were really pissed off with the project because it, was, it had colors. I mean, now it looks so naive. It seems, sounds so naive. And at one point, there was a, uh, we were, uh, I had to, to give a lecture in, in Porto. 
and there were all these people that were uh, that were uh, super Alvaro Sisa followers, and <laughs> actually people that were teaching with him and had been working, and they were totally outraged by the colors. And then Alvaro Sisa came late to the to the discussion, and then he said, "Yeah, I've seen this in a magazine. I love the colors." Oh, yeah, yeah. And then. <laughs> <laughs> So all the discip disciples were yeah. really like the the yeah. the, the, the you follow someone, don't follow the di disciple. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So I think uh, uh, this. Uh, I always have to fight uh, uh, f for a long time before I get to the to the intelligent people. <laughs> and, uh, but but it's true that colors were very intentional. I, I saw that was uh, that. Uh, I mean, now it's uh, it's. it's I, I don't think anyone would discuss it that way, but, but colors were surrounding us as uh, something that was everywhere in our culture. Clothes, uh, uh, cars, um, posters, uh, records, uh, TV, everything was colorful. The only thing that was not colorful was basically serious architecture. <laughs> so, so basically it was very much about just letting in, yeah, rather than any other thing. Great. Mm -hmm. so I, I'm with you on that. Um, <laughs> so maybe we should open it up to questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andres. Mm -hmm. Or complaints, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you think the aspect of uh, Cosmo being toxic? Oh. Do you think the aspect of Cosmo being a toxic, quote unquote, environment? Um, or quote unquote toxic environment, um, <laughs> had anything to do with people wanting to party there? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. No, I don't think so. I think they would be partying anyway. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> but they were partying with toxicity that year, yeah. And the year before they were partying with other things. So I think that experiment uh, of the PS1 has been very exciting because it made people party together with other things that they would never expect. And then once they party, they would take photographs of themselves party and they would publish them so other people would see them partying with toxicity. In, in the previous year, they were partying with, with plants and with, with uh, growing uh, inedible things and other years they were partying. So I think what is very, very beautiful is that people go there because they want to party, but once they're there, they become part of an experiment, an experiment of architecture being different to the one that they're used to be, they, they're used to. And, what the, and then they start to do things. They start to look at this architecture and they start to follow what happens with toxicity or the end they gain an experience that somehow is conveyed and shared with others, and it expands already what we can imagine that is possible. And I would imagine now to many people could do parties of toxicity about, around the garbage that the, the very party is producing, for instance. I would imagine that that, that wouldn't be a bad thing to do. Uh, but, but I think architecture and the architecture that uh, we discuss and the architecture that end up having a big influence is also about making it possible to imagine other and to experience uh, uh, other alternatives. So that's why I think the IMS were so focused on not letting other things be in the picture because, I mean, not the IMS, the IMS probably were following just something that was in the air. But, uh, but that's why at that time it was so important not to let things be experienced because that was probably the way to, uh, to, to, to I mean, uh, Kiss Buke was saying something very interesting for me that uh, consensus and the elimination of uh, minorities uh, was focusing societies and way, was making them more efficient. So probably all that that is lost when a society is done super efficient uh, is something that we as architects could bring in somehow. <laughs> Everybody wants to party, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask a question about uh, the, the precise way in which your architecture is political. Uh, and yeah. you, you just made this amazing comment that, right, the exclusion of things from the frame is also a political act. Yeah. Is, is I think, what, sort of the implication of what you just said. Uh, all of the things that you described seem like a kind of, of making visible mm -hmm. as political act. 
What are the particular political stakes or implications or impulses associated with the act of making visible? And, and how do you see architecture as sort of having particular agency in this field of politics? Yeah, no, it's a super good question. Actually, that's one of my main interests. Uh, what, is the, what specific forms of politics are played by architectural practices? And there's many, many, many different ones. Uh, for instance, if you think of the whole, uh, the way uh, for a long time, when someone would talk about politics and architecture, uh, it would be mainly about, for instance, architects demonstrating. And that's super good, uh, but it's not the ones that I'm referring to. Or for instance, they would uh, talk about participation and uh, having, for instance, different options and uh, users voting. And that's, again, super important, but it's not the ones that I'm interested on. The ones I'm interested on are the, the forms of politics that are very much embedded in uh, design, the de either material design or the design of the performativity of architecture. So I'm very interested in particular uh, on the way dimensions, materiality, colors, uh, the way something is produced, the information that is gathered uh, to make possible an architecture, uh, all those things are shaping forms of society as most likely what's more likely and others as less likely. Of course, the boundaries between all these forms of politics are very blurred and, uh, and the, the, the limits of them are really, really something that is also exciting to inhabit. But I would say that I'm very specifically interested on this that for many people are related to the, to the realm of SDS, of material participation, of cosmopolitics. In regards to the second part of your question that has to do with uh, making things visible or uh, the regimes of visibility through architecture, transparency, all these different ways of discussing this. Yes, I'm super interested on in that, but I would say that that is not detached from other uh, ways of being political. For instance, for me, it's also very interesting to understand uh, architecture doing politics as a way of dealing with uh, criticality installing criticality in daily life, for instance, which is not exactly the same that making things visible, because it's also, for instance, about what are the publics that you can convene through architecture. Or for instance, I'm very interested in the way things get composed together, uh, and what is the way that we can recompose the population or the composition, or the, let's say, the, uh, the um, society, a piece of architecture, uh, it's part of two interventions. So I, I would say that I'm interested in that, but also on, on other things. But yeah, what, what do you think? What do you think architecture uh, has to do with politics? <laughs> because your question was very intentional, so probably you have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I, I think all, all architecture is political. The, yeah. the act of, of drawing a line on a piece of paper is, is political when that line implies a, a line in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess I, it seems like the, the making of things visible and therefore part of the, the social conversation or the, the, the social politics has a very a very particular kind of political impact, yeah. uh, and one that that maybe I I don't normally think of as being the operation in which architecture is political. Yeah, uh, maybe it's the operation in which journalism is political. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I guess I was just I was intrigued that this is the f uh, the form of politics that seemed most prominent yeah. uh, in the work that you were presenting. But you know that the boundaries between journalism and architecture are very very, very blur, and uh, journalism and architecture are many, many common tools. For instance, I, I, when I was doing this work on uh, Miss van der Rohe, I was very surprised to read in one of his interviews that he was asked, how did you get an architectural education? And he responds, uh, well, you know, I was not looking at architectural magazines. I was looking at other publications, political publications, but not the ones that have to do with political parties, but Politics like Walter Lippmann would talk about politics. That is precisely what he said. Walter Lippmann is basically the one that, in the school of journalism, they're talking all day long about Walter Lippmann. So basically, the people that were discussing journalism in the US at the time that uh, Miss Van der Rohe arrived here, 
uh, were basically discussing the same authors that Miss van der Rohe was discussing. So I, I think that Miss van der Rohe had a lot to do with the discussions of the making of public space and in many ways, uh, uh, but maybe he did it differently. <laughs> Hi, um, sorry, this might come as a little cheeky, but um, in, if you had to sum up in one word, how would you describe your, um, your pedagogy? If you had oh, wow, <laughs> one word. <laughs> Just to sort of narrow down the intention one of word. unblack boxing. <laughs> Only one, wow, this is difficult. This is where you go to paint. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I would say it's a search for relevance in a way. It's a search for relevance. Uh, but that's three words. <laughs> that's OK. Relevance. <laughs> but everything's relevant in a way. So it's, it's about how to do that. Yeah, so. See you in the fall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, I, I would like to know if you have like thought about how to make a project like uh, Cosmo, like to develop it to be like a more permanent uh, I development. I don't know, like to something yeah. structure or I don't know, something that not just as an event but as a yeah. Permanent thing. Well, nothing's that permanent. That's the big thing about Cosmo, <laughs> that everything's kind of moving and changing. So even if you do something, uh, uh, Newton Creek won't be that permanent. After a while, it will change. I mean, every, all, all the time is different. So that, that, that's one way of responding to your question. Actually, I, I think all architecture is temporary uh, because it deals with time, it evolves, it changes. And I think this is crucial when you look at things, for instance, from an ecosystemical point of view. Nothing is that fixed, and the parts that are moving faster probably are the ones that are more interesting uh, in architecture at one point. So, the, the you know, like in a motorbike, the parts that are more exposed are the ones that probably get easier, uh, that they need to be replaced. But if you're talking of longer term, more than a summer, uh, we actually, uh, we have a, a commission to, to do uh, another version of Cosmo at the square in the, in the science museum that is being built in Moscow now. And it's really difficult to make it something that could last uh, because basically it needs to produce, uh, you need other actors involved. For instance, you need uh, uh, to make sure that there's going to be a scientific team that is taking care of it. Uh, because this ecosystem is very risky. It could really at one point evolve into something different. So there's, there's a need to rethink the way architecture is designed if you want to make it something that stays for a longer run. Or for instance, uh, the, the toxicity that is produced in Moscow and that we would be dealing with coming from the Science Museum could be really different because the Science Museum is part of the Polytechnic School and there's a number of laboratories that are installed there. So the, the diversity of toxicities that could be reaching this machine would be very different. Uh, so uh, in order to make it more durable, let's say, uh, and also to deal with a context that is a little bit more complex than the one of PS1, we basically had to enlarge the social network that is making this project happen. And that is not only about people, but it's also about the, the kind of plants that we're introducing there, the bacteria, the algae, the, of course, the people that are dealing with these, the technologies, the money holes, the valves, all these things. So what is interesting is that you reach high, reaching higher levels of complexity, in this case, meant bigger uh, social mobilization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe one, one last question. So Andres, when, when you know, I look at your work, I become suspicious of everything. Behind everything, there's a basement, or you know, behind every church, there's some kind of strange practice, and so on. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, probably. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> You're right. Yeah. And, and even, you know, I think about words like context. We can't trust them anymore because they're exclusionary, right? Like for you, project is context. So what about the basement of Andres Hake? Like, in a way, can you reveal a bit of the context? I mean, in a, yeah. in a sense, you're uh, asking us to sort of look at the political context as being the, the pro, you know, what your work is produced from directly, but you've also stated that there's no, in a sense, distinction between the disciplinary and the kind of, you know, the reality as, as, as it were. What about the architectural context? Who are your, um, I won't say masters, but like the kind of, you know, the, 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 that world that you emerged within, not those teachers who told you the color is, you know, always a material, yeah. but where, is there, do you have others that you, have looked at in, as, you, as you grew up, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's a very, very good question. Because actually, for instance, the, the, the office we have in Madrid is literally a basement. So it's basically, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that, that we have a basement, it's that we're the basement, basically. <laughs> so there's nothing else. Yeah, it's the, the basement is the, the place where we work. And actually, basements have been very important uh, in, in a big part of what, what we do. Um, in many ways. Uh, if you talk of the context, I, I think that uh, I could tell you a big list of uh, people that were super important when I was uh, evolving and now. And Actually, I would say that architecture is very social. It's very much about uh, getting connected to others and to be also generous and respectful to others and understand what is that, that they're doing, but also connecting yourself to those things that are important. Uh, I, I think that it's not uh, something, I mean, I, I, that, that, that is an exception. I think any form of knowledge is about, uh, is a collective knowledge. And uh, to, in, in, my, in my case, I can give you some tracks of that, not that much names, but for, for, uh, for me it was very important uh, a big part of the context of Spanish architecture that was very much in the boundaries of what was the tendenza at one time. So people like Prada Pool, Juan, Nav Juan Navarro Valdebeg, in his earlier works uh, that were actually connected to Georgi Kepes, was really a tradition that was very important that then, of course, it was very important people like Juan and many others that were operating in the School of Madrid and that were really producing alternatives and making the discussion much more international and connected to things. Uh, but but, but uh, also for, for me, it was at that time very important to look at the context of sociology and in particular the tradition of uh, discussions of technology, of so, so, sociology of technology, and the group of Bruno Latour, Michel Calon, Fabian Muniesa, uh, Albena Yaneva, Norge Mares, a big group of people that were discussing architecture very much in, de in the details and looking at the conflicts that architecture was producing uh, as part of the School of uh, Mine Engineers initially, uh, it was very important also the context of uh, ecological, uh, uh, the political ecology, because there were not that much uh, focus on sustainability or uh, looking at uh, energy efficiency, things like that, that were a little bit simplified in the whole discussion, but more thinking of the way different natures, different species, different uh, technologies were uh, negotiating their uh, cohabitants. And that was a discussion also of politics, but was a discussion of material politics. And for instance, that, that was very much connected to the context of uh, pragmatism in the US uh, at one point. And for instance, Walt, Walt, uh, Walt, uh, Walter Lippmann, as I mentioned before, and John Dewey. Um, I could go on and on. And of course, uh, in the last years, uh, I've been here already for, I believe, something like seven, eight years. And of course, for instance, the whole context of Colombia, the discussion of Colombia, but also the, 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 the discussion of many independent practices that are operating in the area of New York, like, like you, like many of the people that are here, that are sharing a conversation on many, many uh, things that uh, I've been talking today about. So, so I think it's, I don't know, I would defend that architecture is very collective. And I think it within, to find your place and, your, uh, and know how to be part of this collective is probably mm -hmm. what also emerging as an architect is about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great, great way to end. Thank you so much, Andres, and thank you everyone. <laughs>